Hello, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to the leading voices in Bitcoin about their origin stories and their philosophy on BTC. This podcast does not provide financial advice. I'm super excited to share my guest this week as someone who's become very big in the Bitcoin world, but he thinks it's going to zero. The ultimate gold bug himself, Peter Schiff. Now, I think it's important to bring in some contrarian viewpoints, and Peter has really become intertwined in the Bitcoin community online for his arguments against it. Now, Peter, if you're not familiar with him, is a very successful investment advisor and economics forecaster, and he believes in free market economics and in capitalism. He was one of the few people to predict the 2008 financial crisis, and he thinks that's just a prelude to an even bigger sovereign debt crisis the United States is facing that could lead to the collapse of the dollar. Peter says our economy is propped up with phony or crony capitalism, and he says that it's the central banks and government bureaucrats who just want to get reelected that are causing the problems that we're facing today. He thinks that Bitcoin will ultimately fail and instead advises investing in things like foreign markets with sound fiscal policies and in global commodities like gold, silver, and other physical precious metals. I had a long ranging chat with Peter. I'm super grateful for the time that he shared and here's his story. Well, Peter, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk to you today. And you're really, you're contrarian for this podcast because I mostly talk to leaders in Bitcoin. So, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to talking about Bitcoin, but I want to start kind of at the beginning. I want people to know a little bit more about you and I want to learn more about you. So I read that you're from New Haven, Connecticut, but you're actually the son of Polish immigrants, which I was excited about because I'm from Poland. So can you tell me a little bit about where you're from? Yeah, well, I was born in New Haven, and I lived there until I was around five. And my parents divorced around that time, and my mom really moved us to Manhattan. We lived there for a little while. Then my mom moved down to Florida to be closer to her parents. And so we were there for quite some time, eventually came back up to New York, back in the city again, until kind of midway through high school, my mom, for business related reasons, moved us out to Southern California. And then I kind of remained in California for about 20 years, you know, between Northern and Southern California, I went to college up North and then eventually came back to Connecticut, interestingly enough, in 20, 2005. And uh, both of my children from my second marriage were born in Connecticut. My my older son, a lot of people know Spencer because he's, uh, you know, kind of drunk the Bitcoin Kool-Aid and he's out there. So uh, people know him. He was born in California, but my other two children were born in Connecticut. And just recently, 2017, uh, my family and I, we all moved to Puerto Rico, which is where I live now. So how did your grandparents come to immigrate and what did your parents do? Yeah, well, it's the Polish parents are on my father's side. So they're the ones that settled in New Haven, probably around the turn of the 19th century, you know, early 1900, late, you know, 1890s, I forget exactly when they showed up on Ellis Island. But what brought my grandfather to New Haven was he was a carpenter and he got a job working, constructing the Yale Bowl. And so that's what brought him to Connecticut. And then that's where he stayed and he lived there for his entire life. And I read that your dad was a prominent person within the tax protester movement and ended up in prison. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, I mean, my dad uh, basically also grew up in the Haven, the Haven area, born there, stayed there for most of his life. Uh, he did spend some time in New York City and then some time in his later years living in Las Vegas. But my father, his background was an insurance agent, but he was, you know, very free market oriented guy, very rare for a Jewish uh, American to be conservative. He was a big supporter of Barry Goldwater at a time when very few people did. He was very politically active at that point in time, uh, constantly going down to the Yale Green and arguing with socialists. He you know, believed in hard money. He was somebody who testified in 1968 against the removal of gold backing from U.S. currency. He was one of the only people to testify uh, against that. Uh, both the then Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Fed thought it was a good idea 
Uh, they thought that the price of gold, which was $35 an ounce, would fall if uh, we went off the gold standard. They thought the dollar would be stronger if it was liberated from gold and that inflation uh, would be lower. Of course, everything that the Fed chairman said and the Secretary of Treasury said was wrong. Uh, my father was 100% right. And it's interesting because we now have uh, Fed chairman and sec secretaries of the Treasury making the same uh, ridiculous forecasts on inflation and the dollar uh, that are going to turn out to be equally as wrong. But, you know, my dad wrote his first book, The, um, uh, the Biggest Con, came out in 1974. A uh, very uh, well-reviewed book, over 100 good reviews, Wall Street Journal. I forget who else reviewed it, but it was very well-received when it came out, very critical of the U.S. government. But when he was doing his research for that book, that's when he stumbled on a lot of stuff uh, related to the income tax and really discovered that the U.S. government was uh, enforcing, collecting the income tax in violation of law, uh, numerous Supreme Court decisions of the Constitution, and then for... Uh, basically patriotic purposes, he really stopped paying income taxes in 1974 and didn't file a tax return uh, since and constantly battled with the IRS, very public. You know, he was not trying to hide anything. Uh, he was very upfront about his uh, not uh, complying with uh, unconstitutional or illegal laws. Uh, but, you know, ultimately he was in and out of jail three times uh, the final was a 10-year sentence, which turned out to be a life sentence because my father didn't go to jail until he was, uh, I think, 77 and then died in jail at the age of 87. Probably would still be alive today had he had better medical attention, even though he was supposedly in a top-rated government uh, facility for people over 80. They gave him no health care whatsoever. He got skin cancer, which was undiagnosed and untreated, and it eventually spread you know, all over his body and he died of lung cancer, but he really died of an untreated uh, skin cancer. And, you know, that's an example of a government health care, because when you put government in charge of health care, you get no health care. You, you, you die. Wow. So he must have really informed how you think about everything. And do you feel kind of driven to just preserve sort of his legacy and and further some of the things he taught you about economics? Yeah, I mean, everything I really know about economics, you can trace back to, you know, the lessons I learned from my father at a young age. In fact, I even wrote a book with my brother, uh, How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, that was based on a book my dad wrote. But that book was really based on stories that he used to tell my brother and I just driving around in the car. But, you know, I, I discovered these free market Austrian principles, Ayn Rand, you know, at a very young age. I mean, you know, elementary school, junior high school, I was already reading this stuff. And, you know, I, you know, helped impart that to, you know, to my older son, uh, Spencer. And so, you know, that's how he started uh, on this path. And, you know, my other children probably, uh, you know, will have the same thing. Um, but I didn't follow in my father's footsteps as far as, you know, trying to lead a tax protest movement. Uh, I saw where that, you know, led my dad and I didn't want my life to turn out that way. Uh, so I've, you know, paid all the taxes that the U.S. government claims I owe, even though I think that the whole thing is unconstitutional uh, and the government is violating the law. I don't believe my father was wrong in his understanding of the law. He was just wrong in believing that he could prevail against a corrupt government in their own corrupt court system. And so I'm kind of playing by their rules, uh, even though their rules uh, are a violation of the big, you know, the, the broader scope rules of the Constitution and things like that. Uh, but I don't, I, you know, I do want to pay as little tax as I can, like a lot of other people. And that's one of the reasons that I now live in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And so uh, I, I pay a very, very low tax rate. So, you know, I, my dad knew that I was coming down here, but he died uh, before I made the move. But he knew I was coming down here. I had already moved a business down here. I had bought a condo down here. And I, I spoke to my father about, you know, my plans to move to Puerto Rico. But I think he ended up dying uh, in the fall of the year before I actually moved here. Oh, wow. Well, so when you were growing up, what did you want to be? Did you, I saw you studied <laughs> finance and accounting. So did you grow up wanting to be an economist, a professor, a stockbroker? I know your first job was as like a stockbroker or financial consultant, right? 
Yeah. So I, I wanted to be a lot of weird things as a kid. You know, what I remember wanting to be a marine biologist. <laughs> um, but uh, that's when I was living in Florida and I was kind of into, into the water. But I'm sure I had all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, occupations, you know, firemen or whatever I wanted to be when I was a little kid. But yeah, I, I probably by high school, I knew I was going to do something financial, you know, related. Uh, but I ended up going into, into investment sales because I ended up having a lot of sales jobs uh, in high school, uh, part-time jobs. And uh, when I was in college, so um, so kind of being a stockbroker is where I kind of started, which was a mixture because it's really, you know, a personal relationship sales type job, but you're selling uh, investments. So there are some aspects of finance, although I majored in finance and accounting at Berkeley, but none of that really, you know, was too relevant to, you know, what I ended up doing after I graduated. Yeah. And your first job was at Lehman Brothers. Did I see that? No, that was, you know, that was probably my first uh, job from a big firm, but I worked for a smaller uh, company, a uh, gold company uh, in uh, Newport Beach. And then I started my own uh, futures IB with a few other partners. So I did that for a while before I ulted, ended up at, at, at Shearson Lehman Brothers. So did you reach success and wealth pretty quickly. I mean, because I think a lot of people look at the finance world and they think, well, that's what you go into if you want to be rich. Did you, at what point did yeah. you, were you like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well? Not at all, really. I mean, it took me a while. I mean, I made some money early on in my 20s because I kind of got lucky in a cellular phone lottery uh, where I kind of invested in these partnerships for these rural areas. And you know, so I don't know, I didn't, I, maybe I made myself a hundred grand or something, you know, in my mid twenties and kind of like, I lived off of that money for a while. And, you know, I lived, you know, relatively frugally, um, not extravagantly, uh, but that kind of enabled me to start my business. Um, the broker dealer, you know, after I left Lehman and I started my business for the first couple of years, I didn't make really any money at all. So I kind of was living off that, that savings. Um, but then after a couple of years, I started to make money, but I didn't really make real money, uh, you know, good money until the year 2000. That's really when I started to make a lot of money. Uh, I mean, not even, a, not a lot by my current standards, but a lot by the standards back then. Uh, and, and so I was probably what, 30, 35, 36 years old. So I didn't really start making good money until, you know, my mid thirties. And, um, and then it just kept growing from there. So, um, but you know, a lot of people today, I mean, people are, you know, multimillionaires or billionaires. I mean, some of them and you know, before they even turn 30. So by today's standards, I got rich very slowly. <laughs> well, um, you, you're sort of a beneficiary, I would think of the fiat system and growing up studying Austrian economics. Did you kind of think like, okay, this is, these are the issues with the system and this is what I want to start to call out. Or, I mean, did you think you were kind of benefiting from the system? Well, I mean, I only benefited from criticizing the system, although it's hard to know, you know, the counterfactual, what would have happened to me had I not had this understanding? I mean, you know, maybe I would have even more money if I just, you know, was just doing all this crazy stuff and immersed myself in the dot com world and and maybe even ultimately in crypto. Right. I mean, if it wasn't for the knowledge I have, I would have done a lot of foolish things. But there are a lot of billionaires right now that are rich because they're part of the foolish things that that they did, although maybe, you know, they took advantage of the foolish things other people could do, but they may not have really understood it. I mean, I I have a certain understanding that kind of prevented me from getting into those bubbles even early on when I may have been able to get out, you know, with a profit before before they pop. But I mean, I've certainly done well, I think, in that area, I mean, because I'm not the only guy that's out there as a hard money guy or, you know, gloom and doom or gold bug. I mean, there are different ways the mainstream will try to describe people that don't conform to their view, right? Unconventional, outside the box. And so I think, you know, as far as in that territory where, you know, where I am, uh, I think I've managed to, to do pretty well, at, you know, as far as, you know, raising my profile and, 
and 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 make you know making a good living and doing well with my own investments i've been able to you know find some very very uh good performing investments personally of course i've invested in some complete disasters too uh <laughs> but you know a number but i've had enough successes uh you know without being in the bubbles uh but to find real value and, and be able to, to make money you know i'm not like i'm not a short seller where you know the market going up has been a big problem for me because i'm long I'm just, you know, not long the types of investments that a lot of other people might be long. So when did you really get into gold? How did you become a gold bug? Oh, I've always uh, known about gold. As I said, my dad testified in 1968. I was, that was five years old. So my dad was a big believer in gold. When I got bar mitzvahed, I put all my bar mitzvah money into gold. Wow. Now, I didn't hold it forever because it went up. And I sold my gold, and that's how I bought my first car. Wow. You know, as, as a senior in high school, I bought a car with my bar mitzvah money. I bought an MGB uh, was, the, was the car. 1976, it was four years old when I bought it. Wow. Stick shift. I didn't even know how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> I bought the car, and I learned to drive after I bought it. Right? So, <laughs> well, I had it. You know, I, I, I had never driven it, and I ended up with a stick shift car. But yeah, no, I've, you know, I've been into gold. And again, my first job out of college was with a gold company. I didn't stay there that long, but that's where I was. And, and, and one summer, I had a summer job, I think, uh, between sophomore and junior year, I was working for a gold company. And how much was the car, just out of curiosity, back then? Uh, I think I paid like 3600 bucks for it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, for yes, I I want, I want to talk a little bit about your Occupy Wall Street, because even though that was a while ago and uh, that was during a different financial crisis, I think it's really relevant to today. So for people that aren't familiar, I mean, it's a phenomenal video. Everyone should check it out. But you basically went to Wall Street as the 1% that they were protesting, and you wanted to engage people in conversations and talk to them about how they should actually be protesting in Washington against central banks and the Federal Reserve. So can you talk a little bit about why you did did that and sort of what the takeaway is even today, because here we are all these years later and we've kicked the can down the road when it comes to our monetary policy. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, I did it because I thought that it was a good idea and it would generate a lot of publicity. I thought a lot of people would would ultimately watch the video. I did it in conjunction with Reason TV, so they were going to put it up on their site. I really wasn't doing much on YouTube myself back then, but but they were. And so I thought it was a good opportunity to go down there and, you know, A, speak to the protesters in a way that nobody else is speaking to them and really try to demonstrate an understanding of, you know, why they were so upset, but try to rechannel their anger to where it belonged, that they shouldn't be upset with capitalism and Wall Street, that it's the government is the Federal Reserve that is the source of the problems, and they're and they're they're blaming the wrong people. Not to say that uh, you know Wall Street was blameless, um, but they were corrupted by the Fed and by the government, and they were simply you know playing the hand that they were dealt. And yeah, they could have taken a principal stand like I did, and uh, but it was very difficult to do that. I mean, I don't blame other people, uh, you know, for getting caught up in the irrational exuberance and just dancing while the music was playing, especially when there's so much pressure put upon you to do that. I mean, there was pressure on me uh, uh, to do that. And, you know, it's so it's not everybody resists it. And, and so I wanted to make sure that uh, they understood that it wasn't capitalism that failed them. Capitalism, capitalism was their salvation. It was a failure to have capitalism. That is the problem. And the reason we don't have capitalism is because of the government and because of the, the Federal Reserve. So I went down there to do that, but I knew that, you know, the effect would be limited just, you know, based on the few hundred people who were down there, right? Now, I didn't even know how many of those people I would get through to. But what I knew is that I would get through to a lot of people who watched it on YouTube because there it was a much bigger audience. And so I think it, it turned out to be one of the one of the best, if not probably the best things that I've done as far as YouTube and video, because when it originally came out, it got millions of views on multiple uh, channels on YouTube. I mean, 
And this is when a million views or more was rare back in the early days of YouTube. Uh, so it was a top video on many, many platforms, crashing uh, various sites. And over the years, many people just re-uploaded it and put it up and got millions more views. I recently put it on my channel for the first time, I think two or three years ago, mm -hmm. and I've got over 5 million views on there. I put it up like seven years, eight years after I did it. And, you know, it's the video that is most watched on my YouTube channel. And what is the best thing about it is there's probably not a week that goes by that somebody from somewhere in the world doesn't email me about that video, sometimes multiple emails in a week, letting, you know, thanking me for doing it and letting me know how it changed their lives. Because normally the story is I was a socialist, I was very left wing or very liberal, and this video opened my eyes. And it might not have completely changed them during that, you know, two hours, but it had enough of an impact that it caused them to do some more research on their own. And ultimately it was responsible for them completely doing 180 degrees, you know, in their own politics and going from liberal socialist, you know, to free market, libertarian, conservative, wherever they are. And so, yeah, so, you know, in, in that respect, it worked. You know, the, the video did exactly what I hoped it did. In fact, it probably exceeded uh, my expectations. Well, I want to dig into some of your economic viewpoints, and some of them are very, very powerful. Um, but before we do that, can you kind of lay an overview of Austrian economics? Because the free market and capitalism, which you believe in, lay at the foundation of Austrian economics. And it's very different than the type of economics a lot of people are learning at universities here in the U.S. So can you kind of break that down in simplest terms just very briefly for us? I mean, really, Austrian economics is astronomy and what everybody is learning today at universities is astrology, <laughs> right? It's all a bunch of nonsense. Austrian economics is real economics and it basically it has the focus on supply and savings and it recognizes that, you know, the important thing is not the demand. Demand is infinite. Everybody wants stuff. The key is to produce stuff that people want. And where does production come from? It comes from capital. Where does capital come from? It comes from savings. So the important thing is savings. Savings drives capital investment. Capital investment drives production and productivity. Uh, and that ultimately allows consumption. The Keynesians have the cart before the horse. They think that demand is the key. And all their economic policies are designed to stimulate demand. And that's wrongheaded. Uh, we don't have to stimulate demand. Demand is there. We need to stimulate production, supply, and the free market does that, and the government interferes with that process. But also, one of the things that the Austrians understand is where the business cycle comes from, that it's not some natural flaw in the capitalist system, that the business cycle, the boom and bust cycle of recession, depression, is a byproduct of central bank artificial manipulation of interest rates. It's when the central banks keep interest rates artificially low, that's a, a, a rate that is below what the free market would put rates at. Uh, it leads to malinvestments and bubbles, and those bubbles inevitably burst, leading to the uh, recession. And what the Austrians understand is it's the booms, it's these artificial periods, uh, of you know apparent prosperity that are the problem that's where the mistakes are made it's the bust it's the recession that is the helpful process of cleansing the economy of the mistakes that were made during that phony boom so the conventional wisdom is recessions are bad and the government needs to do whatever it can to prevent them but the austrians say no recessions are good we need to allow them. Now, it's not that we want recessions, but once we make the mistake of creating a phony boom, the sooner that boom can bust, the sooner the problems can be fixed. But the way the Keynesians are, they never allow the problems to be fixed because when one bubble pops, they quickly inflate another one so that we don't have to deal with the pain of correcting the problems. But then we're ultimately going to have to deal with the greater pain of correcting even bigger problems. 
And I think that's where we are now. We have kicked a can down the road so many years by trying to delay uh, the pain that comes from a real reckoning uh, with these uh, mistakes and malinvestments uh, that now when we ultimately have to pay the piper, which we will, it's going to be so much worse. And I think, you know, we're very, very close to that happening. I mean, I thought we were close a while ago and it turned out that there was a little more can kicking that they could do. But if you look at where we are now with massive money printing, inflation blowing up, all the crazy stuff that's going on in the markets from the meme stocks, stocks, you know, to the cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, this has got to be the end of it. You know, the Fed is at the end of its rope. And unfortunately, it's the, the, the economy that's going to hang. Well, going back to talking about the booms and busts you mentioned, you predicted the financial crisis in a way you even made money on it. What lesson should we have learned back then that we didn't? Well, you know, it, we, we should have learned or, you know, there are probably some people that learned the lesson, but not the right people, not the people uh, on Wall Street, uh, not anybody at the Fed or not anybody in, in government or academia. But the financial crisis was a byproduct of artificially low interest rates and the mistakes that were made during that environment. And the Fed did that to get us out of the recession that followed the bursting of the dot-com bubble, which again was inflated by the same wrong-headed policies. Uh, and when that bubble popped, the Fed doubled down on those mistakes and inflated the housing bubble. It was quite obvious to me what the Fed was doing wrong and what the consequences would be. I warned about the coming financial crisis for years. And not only did I warn about the crisis that was coming and why, but what the government was gonna do in response. And of course I was right again, the government tripled down on its mistakes. Instead of learning from them, like, oh my God, we kept interest rates artificially low and too much money was borrowed to do non-economic things. We had too many people overpaying for houses. We had all, all, all people were consuming more than they should have because they thought they were richer than they were because they were basing their wealth on these inflated asset prices that only existed because of the artificially low interest rates. So we totally distorted the economy. We created this massive bubble that was inevitably gonna burst. And now we're having to deal with the consequences of all the losses uh, from all the loans that never should have been made and never would have been made, but for our mistakes. Instead of learning that lesson, they just repeated the mistakes on a bigger scale. They didn't just raise rates to lower rates to 1%. They went all the way down to zero and they left them there for what, eight years instead of like a year and a half. And they never normalized rates. The highest they got was 2% or two and a half before going right back to zero. And they threw quantitative easing into the mix, something that they didn't even do during the housing bubble days, you know, they went all in and did that uh, after that bubble popped. And so they have inflated today a bubble that is larger than the stock market bubble and the housing bubble combined. And it has done far more damage to the economy than either of those two bubbles. And therefore the consequences when this massive bubble pops are far more severe than anything we experienced during the great recession that followed uh, the bursting of the housing bubble. Well, so how will that bubble burst play out? Because right, you're right, you've been talking about bubbles since, you know, for a decade now, and we keep kicking the can down the road. And we had a mini pop during COVID, everything crashed, but now we're at record highs again. So when this bubble finally bursts, what does that look like? Because essentially you're, you're saying it won't be necessarily the stock market crashing, it's just gonna be the debasement of the dollar. And will foreign entities just finally say, hey, we don't want the dollar? Well, the last two bubbles popped because the Fed tried to normalize rates. And, you know, and when they did, they basically took away the punch bowl and everybody was hung over. And then all the mistakes were obvious. So this time around, I think the one thing that the Fed has learned from the past is you never do that. You can talk about normalizing rates, but you never actually do it. They don't want to take the punch bowl away. They don't want anybody to sober up because then they'll see what a disaster the Fed has created. So this bubble is not going to burst because the Fed raises rates. It's going to burst because it doesn't raise rates. It's going to burst because the dollar crashes, because inflation runs out of control, ultimately either forcing the Fed to raise rates much higher and much faster uh, than anybody would have imagined, or we they don't raise them at all. We have hyperinflation. 
and you know the dollar becomes practically worthless. But uh, it, it, this is going to be much worse and end much diff diff differently, I believe, than either of those uh, prior to uh, bubbles. Well, so inflation is obviously in the headlines now, but it seems like the media and government officials are saying, hey, it's not a big deal or it's transitory. It's actually lower than we expected. Um, what are your thoughts on inflation and what should Americans know? Yeah, well, A, it's a tax. It's a, you know, and it's the way most Americans are going to have to pay for big government and all the new government programs that uh, the Biden administration is advocating and that are working their way through Congress now infrastructure, whatever this new deal that they're coming up with, everybody's going to get free um, pre-K, free nursery school, free community college, uh, free family medical leave, uh, people on Medicare are going to get more benefits, more dental, more vision, whatever it is, all this money, we're already broke. And we're, you know, div you know, doling out all this new money we don't have. And so it's all going to be printed. And, and so that's going to destroy the value of the wages and the savings that Americans have. And so that amounts to a tax. But, you know, what the government is doing now with inflation is exactly what I predicted they would do, because first they deny that there's inflation and they did that for a long time. Then they say, OK, we have inflation, but that's a good thing because this is what we need. We didn't have enough inflation. So thank God we've got inflation. Then. They start saying, well, OK, it's a little higher than we really want, but don't worry, it's just transitory. And initially, transitory means temporary, like, oh, the price hikes won't stick right after we get back to normal prices will go back down to normal. Then they change the definition of transitory to mean permanent, meaning that, well, what's transitory are not the price hikes, they're permanent. What's transitory is how much longer they're going to be going up at this pace, which they don't even know. Uh, so they keep changing their tune and, and, and moving the bar, but they're still pretending that if inflation ever really became a problem, even though it already is a huge problem, but they're claiming if it ever became a problem, well, they have the tools to, to fix it, right? Which maybe they do, but they would never actually use them because if the Fed was willing to use its tools, it would have already used them. The reason it's not is because it can't, and so it won't. And eventually what I think the Fed is going to come out and say is, you know what, inflation is a lot more than 2%, whatever it is, 4%, 5%, 6%. But you know what, get used to it, because it's going to be with us for a long time. And it's okay, because it's better than the alternative. It's the price we pay for prosperity. It's the price we pay for a strong labor market and income inequality and a Green New Deal. And whatever it is, they're just going to say, we have to accept high inflation as you know a fact of life that that's what's ultimately coming i love what you've said before about how america used to be the world's biggest creditor now it's the world's biggest debtor and we're getting poorer and our standard of living is de decreasing but at the same time we don't look like we're living um poor because we're basically borrowing to purchase other countries' products, right? And so it seems like we're able to kick the can down the road in that sense because everyone is on the U.S. dollar. That's the global reserve currency. But how do you predict that actually changes? I mean, it well, playing it, out. It's, well, you know, the reason we the dollar became the reserve currency was because everybody needed dollars to buy our products. We made all the television sets. We made all the radios, all the sewing machines, you know, most of the cars, you know, that we made everything in America. We were the manufacturing center of the entire world when the dollar became the reserve currency. Also, the U.S. had most of the world's gold, right? Had, where did we get all that gold? Well, we earned it all with huge trade surpluses. How did America become the world's wealthiest creditor nation? We had so such large trade surpluses. We earned all this money and then we invested that money by buying assets in other countries. So the rest of the world was buying our goods that we made and then we bought up their assets. We bought their stocks. We bought their bonds. We bought their real estate. That's what rich countries do. They accumulate assets. What poor countries do is they go into debt to consume. They accumulate liabilities. That's what America is doing. America is the mirror image of the, of the country that was bestowed the privilege of issuing the reserve currency. Nobody would, would pick America today based on the characteristics of the world's biggest trade deficits, the world's biggest budget deficits, and the world's biggest debtor nation, 
where we owe more money than all the other debtor nations of the world combined. Uh, America borrows from the poorest nations on earth. I mean, so eventually the world is going to wake up to the reality that they don't need dollars because they don't need to buy what we make because we don't make the stuff anymore. They make the stuff. Uh, we need their currency. They don't need our dollars. And, and so it's very close to a point where uh, the dollar is going to implode. And I think that's going to be when the world realizes that the Fed has no control over inflation. I mean, the markets, everyone around the world still thinks that the Fed has got this under control and that the Fed is going to raise rates and shrink its balance sheet. That's why every time you see hotter than expected inflation numbers like we got today, we got 1% increase in producer prices, much bigger than the gain that was expected. It matched the 1% from last year a month. We now have cons producer prices up 6.4% in seven months. Mm -hmm. So if this pace keeps up for the rest of the year, that's an 11% increase. We've never seen uh, producer prices up that much in one year, you know, uh, and so this is record increases. Uh, consumers are going to be feeling this as well. They're already feeling it. But the reason that the gold price sold off after these high inflation numbers came out is because everybody expects the Fed to do something about it. Oh, the Fed is going to have to get aggressive. The Fed is going to have to fight to put this inflation genie back in the bottle. Well, when the world recognizes that that fight is never going to happen, because if the Fed tried to fight inflation, it would lose. Inflation would win. So it's not even going to get in a ring and embarrass itself. But when the, the world realizes it, that's when the bottom is going to drop out of the dollar. Because if we're going to have 5%, 6%, 10% inflation every year, forever, mm -hmm. why would you hold on to a dollar that's losing 5 to 10% of its value every right. single year if the only interest that you're getting on it to offset that is, you know, 1%? Right. So, you know, everybody is going to rush for the exits. And, of course, there's no way that everybody can get out because somebody has to buy. Right. Well, so this is creating an environment where it's not surprising that a lot of people are pro-socialism now, especially young people, because that means that the help is on the way. The government's going to provide, you know, the income that you might not be getting from companies. People are upset that there's corporate greed and they actually blame capitalism for a lot of these problems. So I want to ask you a little bit about sort of those different schools of thought. Why, why do you feel socialism is obviously not the right direction we should be heading in? And did we ever have true capitalism in the, in the United States? Well, sure. I mean, nothing is perfect, but we came very, very close. I think the most capitalistic period in American history would go from after the Civil War, so 1865, um, till uh, the, maybe the First World War, the beginning of the Federal Reserve, 1913, you know, around that time period. Uh, during those, that period of time, we had the freest markets, we had the purest gold standard, and that is when we had the greatest increase in living standards uh, in U.S. history. That's when we absorbed, uh, you know, my grandparents coming in from Poland and my other grandparents coming in, uh, you know, from Russia um, on my mother's side. And, um, you know, tens of millions of people showed up in the U.S. and there was no welfare, no food stamps, no Social Security, uh, no minimum wage law, nothing. You know, I mean, my, when my grandfather came here to Poland, he didn't even speak any English. He just had to fend for himself. He was like 13 years old. Had to go get a job. Um, but, um, you know, we created tremendous wealth. We had the Industrial Revolution during that time period. Uh, and so we did really well. And, you know, you can look around and, and look at countries that are socialists, you know, you know, communist or as far to the left as, as you can get. And those are the complete disasters. That's where you have nothing but poverty and where governments have to build walls to keep their citizens in and shoot them if they try to escape. Right. Communism results in misery. That's, it's, you know, communism is a form of socialism. So is fascism. These are all forms of socialism, but it delivers nothing but misery except to the, the people at the top who were in government. They get rich and everybody else is poor. Uh, but under capitalism, you have tremendous and widespread benefits for average people. And, um, you know, all of the problems that people attribute to capitalism are the fault of government and government interference in capitalism. 
And the more we rely on government to solve our problems, the worse those problems are going to get. If we really had capitalism, the problems wouldn't be there. I mean, there's always going to be inequality, right, in capitalism. Uh, and that's a good thing because you want people who succeed to be rewarded for their success because that's where the motivation comes to be successful. But the way you succeed in a free market is by benefiting other people. That's the only way, right? How do I get rich? I try to solve a problem. I try to figure out what people want and provide it to them. I try to give them something better that costs less. And, and you try to anticipate what people want even before they know they want it and, 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 and produce things that are going to improve everybody's lives. And, and, and if you do that, you, you should be rewarded. You know, you want that. Uh, but the problem is, even as capitalism lifts all boats, you always have people whose boats aren't lifted as much who are somewhat resentful of the people who have more than they do. And they, they're not really self-reflective of the fact that, well, these people have more because they deserve more. They produce more. They contributed more. A lot of times you just want to say, well, they're richer than me because they got lucky or because they're greedy or because they do bad things. Uh, and now we need to sick. You know, we need to use government to take some of what they have and give it give it to me. You know, that's that that's the emotion that the politicians play on that envy, which is right. a horrible uh, human emotion. Well, you've said in other interviews and other people have said, you know, there's really no example of socialism actually working. It's a failed experiment. It's good in intentions, but it doesn't it doesn't work out for anybody in the end. So but if capitalism was so great, we had a more true version of it in the past. Why didn't it work? Is that a failed experiment or was it just people coming in wanting to get elected and essentially promising a free lunch? Well, the problem is in capitalism. The problem is democracy. I mean, there is the flawed political system. Capitalism is a great economic system, but democracy is a a flawed political system. And the framers of the U.S. Constitution understood this, which is why they established a republic. A republic, right. And with a lot of checks on democracy to prevent this kind of stuff from happening. But a lot of those checks and balances have been removed. They're, they were, they're still there, but they're no longer enforced uh, you know, by a complicit uh, Supreme Court. And so the government gets away with all sorts of unconstitutional things. And, and so democracy has done a lot of damage because politicians are doing destructive things to get votes, right? So what's, what's important for a politician is getting elected, not doing what's right for the country, but doing what puts you back in office. And so generally what's good politics and what's good in economics are the opposite. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna do something that's good economics, you're probably not gonna get elected or reelected. So it's very perverse incentives. It's the problem with democracy and so that's what people should be upset about. But the alternative is not, OK, let's have a dictatorship. You know, we need to, you know, I, I, I like a Republican form of government. We just have to reimpose the safeguards that we lost. Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen government obviously balloon and with that um, increases in taxes. And one of the things I find so fascinating, especially living in California, is we're literally pouring money on problems and they're just getting bigger. I mean, homelessness is a great example out here. Um, and I remember one interview you did where you said something really interesting. Um, you pointed out that in medieval times, the serfs paid like 25% in taxes and that was considered oppressive. And now if you live in a state like California, you're paying like 50% or more. And the income tax didn't come in until I, b I believe it was like 1913 and that was 7% just to be a tax on the rich, right? So should we be, I mean, yeah. how do you see taxes? And you know, the deal, the deal that was made with the devil back then it's the reason the people supported the income tax was a because they weren't going to pay it but the government said if we tax the rich with an income tax mm -hmm. we'll get rid of this the the, the uh, tariffs because the tariffs were paid by the middle class mm -hmm. and so the government said hey if we can have this income tax we won't need the tariffs anymore and so the public you know got behind it and now of course the average american is paying a much higher rate of tax than was originally envisioned for the Carnegie's or the Rockefeller's. So, I mean, as soon as the government, you know, you give them an inch, they, they, they take a mile. But my point on, on serfdom is, you know, when you look back on the feudal system, we say, yeah, that was really bad. I mean, being a serf because, you know, 25% of what you produce was just taken by the Lord, right? Well, today, most Americans would aspire to be elevated to the level of a serf. I mean, the serfs had it great, 
by American standards. I mean, we fought a revolution over taxes. We wanted to get rid of uh, British rule because we objected to taxes that are tiny compared to the taxes that we impose on ourselves today. And what bothers me even now, when you hear people objecting to the tax hikes that the Biden administration and the Democrats in Congress are you know, talking about uh, for the rich, a lot of the Republican opposition is, hey, this, these are uncompetitive rates. You know, we're gonna, our rates are going to be much higher than, than other countries. And so this is bad. The real, it should really be a moral argument. This is immoral for a government to take so much of what somebody produces. We can't treat our people like slaves, mm-hmm. you know, with even worse than serfs. We can't take 50%, 60% of what somebody earns. This is not fair. That's not right. You, well, know, so- uh, you know, so that's where the objection should be. Also on the constitutionality of these type of taxes, but just on the morality of it. It is not the right thing to take so much from somebody. Well, so how much should we be taxing the wealthy versus the middle class? Because that's that's the main platform for a lot of the Democratic politicians, right? It's like, we're going to tax the wealthy. We're going to get that money back and redistribute well, it. Look, I don't believe in the income tax at all. I don't even think it should exist. I think we should just have consumption taxes and everybody should pay the same rates. Obviously, the rich have a lot more money to spend, and so they'll pay a lot more in taxes. But I don't think that rich people should pay taxes that uh, middle class people or poor people don't have to pay uh, because, you know, there are people are always going to vote for taxes that don't affect them. Everybody's willing to vote to tax the other guy. You should oh, you should have to pay any tax that you are advocating. You shouldn't be ex- exempted from it. Uh, so if we're going to have an income tax, it should apply to everybody's income and it should be the same rate, whether that rate is 10 percent, 15 percent. Everybody should pay it. You know, the school teacher should pay the same rate as the financier. Uh, obviously, if somebody is making 10 million dollars a year at a 10 percent rate, they're going to pay a lot more than somebody who's making 50,000 a year at a 10 percent rate. But everybody is still contributing 10 percent. So we're all in the same boat. And if they want to raise taxes, well, they have to raise the rate on everybody. Right. So if we're going to go from 10% to 12%, we're all in it. So now do the people making 50,000 want to support it? Well, if they do, if, it, if they really think the government expenditures are worthwhile, they should be willing uh, to contribute to the support. You know, now, yes, I mean, people say, well, it's not fair that the rich pay the same rate. Why? That is exactly fair. It's unfair if they have to pay a higher rate. They will pay a higher tax because they're making more money. Mm -hmm. So they are paying more tax. Uh, They're just not paying at a higher rate. This whole idea that taxes have to be progressive I think is wrong. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about corporations because especially today, I think a lot of people are really angry at this sense of corporate greed that they attribute to capitalism. And we have companies where, you know, the CEO is the richest man on the planet. And then at the same company, there's people who are working 40 plus hours and can't really make a living. So is that capitalism? Is that a byproduct of what you call crony capitalism and what solves it? Yeah, you know, first of all, I want to mention too that my view on taxes hasn't changed. So when I first got started and I had my first job and I was making whatever thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, I had the same view that I have now. It's not like, oh, Peter, you know, you make a lot of money, so you don't want the rich to be taxed. I I didn't want the rich to be taxed when I didn't have any money. Uh-huh. You know, I, I just I, I just wanted a fair system and a constitutional system. Uh, but as far as what you're describing now, look. There are a lot of companies where executives are way overpaid based on the Fed's cheap money policy and their ability to issue stock options and these inflated values of their shares. Why are they overpaid because of the Fed? Why are they overpaid because of the Fed? I think it's important for people to understand what you're saying. Well, they're getting compensated in terms of stock and they're getting a lot of option grants and it's the Fed that's causing the value of the stock to go up not because the companies are more valuable or they're earning more. It's just that the share prices are higher due to all the inflation and all the cheap money. But there's also a lot of companies that only exist because of the Fed. They don't exist because they're satisfying our needs. They're not producing goods and services and providing them at a profit. Uh, They're losing money. They're destroying value. 
right? They're taking resources, land, labor, and capital, and destroying value, yet they still exist because they can sell stock. And why can they sell stock? Because of the Fed. So anything you're looking at is distorted right now. But in general, you know, in a free market with sound money and interest rates that are set by supply and demand in the market, not by government decree, you know, you're, you're, you're always going to see disparities. I mean, the CEO is going to make more than the janitor. I mean, because a lot more people can clean toilets than can run a Fortune 500 company. And you don't want the janitor running the company. He'll run it into the ground. In theory, he doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, and, and so you're paid commensurate with your contribution, with your productivity. I mean, if you could hire a CEO and pay him the same as a, ja a janitor and he would do just as good a job, well, the shareholders would do it. You know, but there's competition. If you want the best guy, then you're going to have to pay more than than somebody else. But if all you can do is clean toilets, you got a lot of other people that can do that. So you're how much can you expect to be paid uh, for doing a job that, you know, pretty much anybody could do. Um, so you're always going to get that. But, you know, when people have jobs and I explain this in the Occupy Wall Street video, nobody is forced to accept a job. Nobody is working at gunpoint. So to the extent that somebody has accepted an employment offer, it's because that's the best offer they have. Nobody else was willing to pay more. So they took the best job they can find. And the fact that they don't quit that job means that nobody else offered them a better job. So you're not exploited. If you are voluntarily working at a job and it's the best job you can get, then whatever you're earning, your employer, you know, is your best option. He's not exploiting you. He gave you the best offer that you could find. And of course, nobody is forced to work for anybody. Everybody has the option of being self-employed. So the fact that so many people choose jobs over self-employment, it's because they can make more money working for somebody else than working for themselves. And if they choose to work for somebody else, they can't complain that they're underpaid because if they're underpaid, just quit and work for yourself and pay yourself, you know, something fair. Do you think there's any sort of moral obligation that these really big CEOs or executives who get to extreme levels of wealth have to provide more for their employees who helped create the wealth? Well, you know, if the employees are helping to create the wealth, they're going to be compensated. I mean, that's the only way to retain them. If you've got great employees that are really making a contribution, they're going to quit unless they share in the success. But the employees, when people work for wages, they're making a big trade off, right? Because, you know, when you own a business, you're gambling on the success of that business. You don't make anything if the business doesn't make any money. The owner of the business, as I said, when I started my business, I went years without making any money, but I still paid all my workers. They got paid, even though I didn't make anything. Uh, most people aren't willing to gamble. They, they want a steady paycheck. They're not going to risk uh, making nothing. And, you know, if a company loses money, they don't send the workers a bill. Hey, we lost money this year. You got to give back some of your wages. Uh, you get to keep the wages, whether the company makes money or not. Uh, so, you know, you don't take the risk, you don't take the reward, but ultimately to keep good employees, you're going to have to give them bonuses. You're going to have to give them raises. Otherwise they'll leave because somebody else will. There's competition for workers, just like uh, companies compete for customers. They, they compete for workers. Yeah, but I mean, don't you think it's interesting that, you know, we are seeing even like the minimum wage go up or this push for a large, a higher minimum wage incomes, um, technically higher, you know, even though the dollar is getting debased. But over the last few decades, we have this widening gap between the rich and the poor. And I think it was Arnold Schwarzenegger who uh, talked about, you know, coming here in the 1970s from Austria and the postal worker in Venice could afford to buy a house. He was a postal worker. Today, I mean, if you're a U.S. postal worker, you're not going to be able to buy a house. So like, how, I mean, how did we get there in just a couple of yeah, decades that, and what unwinds yeah, that? That's the bubble, artificially low interest rates you know, misguided policies in California with rent control. You know, what we've got now with this eviction moratorium is going to be a disaster for low income housing. I mean, rents are going to skyrocket. The availability of low income housing is going to collapse. Look, the government has done a lot of damage. And, and that is the problem. That is the reason for the widening uh, disparity, uh, you know, wealth disparity. It's, it's not capitalism. It is uh, these flawed government policies. 
And the solution isn't even more government. That's just going to make the problems worse. We have to acknowledge government's role in creating these problems. And then we have to start dismantling government. You know, the minimum wage law is a perfect example. It's one of the stupidest laws. You know, only a democracy would have a law as stupid as the minimum wage law. The minimum wage should be zero. Um, and it is zero because if you're not able to deliver enough productivity to cover the minimum wage, your wages are zero because nobody is forced to pay the minimum wage. If the minimum wage is just a hurdle that workers need to clear in order to get a job. So when you're out there looking for a job and you don't have a lot of skills, the higher the minimum wage, the harder it's going to be for you to convince somebody to hire you. And the more they raise that minimum wage, the more people they price out of the labor market. And now they're permanently unemployed. They're forever on welfare or maybe they turn to crime. What we need is to completely eliminate the minimum wage. As I said, when my all my grandparents came here, there was no minimum wage and they were fine. They were not exploited. Uh, you know, uh, my, my, my grandfather uh, supported my grandmother. My grandmother never had a job. My grandfather didn't even have a high school diploma, let alone a college diploma. He was a blue collar worker, uh, a carpenter, but he ended up eventually working for himself. He had a couple of people that worked for him, but he, you know, my dad said he didn't, they didn't know if he was upper lower class or lower middle class, mm -hmm. but he ha owned a home in the Haven, large home. My father had seven sisters. My grandfather raised the whole family. Grandmother never had a job. They had help. They had a housekeeper, you know, middle, lower middle class with a housekeeper. In fact, my, they had a car. In fact, for a while, they even had a house at the beach. They had a second vacation house. Wow. They had no debt, had no credit cards, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this was America. They were lower middle class, but how do you support eight kids and a wife, you know, without, without a high school degree, you know, just, you know, as a carpenter, right? A, 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 you know, a tradesman. That's well, that's what my grandfather was. But everybody could do that in America at one time before the government screwed it up. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you something else about CEOs because I think that um, you know you would expect someone who's wealthy, who's an executive or CEO, to you know want fewer taxes or p perhaps be Republican. But you see a lot of these really big CEOs and corporations coming out, and you know the Bill Gates, Bob Iger's, they express very liberal viewpoints and project this image that they are for the people. Is that because they're benefiting from the government? Like, do you think it's genuine when they put those viewpoints out there? Well, I don't know. I mean, certainly it's very self-serving in many respects. I mean, one way big government helps big business because it helps stifle competition because of high taxes and high regulations. It's a lot harder for new businesses to come into existence. And that benefits the larger businesses that are already there. And the more small businesses, government taxes and regulations can put out of business, the better it is for the larger companies that can survive and have the economies of scale. But also, I think certain companies, they, they, they have an image where they, they want to be liked. They want the public to like them. And so the way you show that you're good and the way you get liked is you, you, know, you sign on to all these popular causes that sound good, but that aren't really good. They're really bad. But it's all that matters is intention. So I can show that I'm a good guy. I can signal my virtue uh, by agreeing to all this nonsense because nobody really understands the consequences. But like for me, when I take the high road and I take a principal stance that I know is right, but people don't have the ability or even have the time or understanding to connect all the dots. Because I can take an unpopular view that is actually good economics, but they're not gonna get down into those weeds. They're just gonna see that I've taken an unpopular stance. Oh, I'm a bad person. Whereas somebody else that just takes a popular stance even though the actual consequence of that stance is to make the problem worse that they claim that they're they're solving, they get credit for, you know, for being good. Mm -hmm. I don't get any credit for being good because they're, oh, you're a bad person. You're mean, right? Yeah. You know, and that's why, you know, if you look at a lot of Democrats, they think Republicans are mean. They think they're bad people because they don't advocate these policies. Well, a lot of Republicans, they don't think the Democrats are mean. They just think they're misguided. They don't understand. 
See, the, the Democrats believe this stuff and they think, well, how can somebody not want to do this? They must be a bad person. They don't understand that what they want to do is actually bad. Yeah. So the people who oppose it are good. Well, I think that's interesting when you, you talk about that divide that we all see right now with like the right versus the left. But really, even if the right was in office and Trump was, the quantitative easing continued and they're still providing stimulus and they're still providing, they would arguably probably provide bailouts. So it's, I mean, isn't this really not a left or right issue? It's it's something entirely different at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Again, Republicans have to get elected also. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, it was very frustrating to me. I was a big critic of Trump, even though I voted for him and I supported certain aspects of his presidency, but I was very much opposed to uh, his economic policies of big government spending, uh, deficit spending, expanding welfare spending, expanding warfare spending. Uh, but you had all these Republicans signing onto it, going along with it, claiming that we had the greatest economy ever yeah. mm -hmm. when it was just a big bubble. Yeah. But now, all of a sudden, the Republicans have found religion no, now that they no longer have power. And now they're critical of the deficits and they're critical of, critical of the Fed printing money, even though they weren't critical of it at all when, you know, it was on their watch. Uh, so, yeah, it's a pox on both their houses. The Republicans are only worth anything when they're not in power. But the minute you put them in power, you know, they're as, almost as bad as the Democrats. Maybe not quite as bad, right? Almost. Uh, and that's the choice, right? That's the lesser of two evil, evils uh, when, you come, when it comes to the polls. But, yeah, the, the Republicans to me look like a bunch of hypocrites now to the extent that they're critical of anything that's going on. Well, that's what I think is so frustrating to people, right? It's like, who do you vote for? There's a complete distrust of anyone in Congress. And I know you've mentioned before on podcasts that you think Congress today is nothing like our founders. So are there any politicians that you even like or respect? Yeah, well, you know, there's a handful that I like. Look, I've always been a big Ron Paul fan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you worked on his campaign, right? Yeah, and you know, I was uh, economic advisor on the 2010 presidential campaign, but I've known uh, Ron for quite some time. I always considered him my congressman, even though he was in Texas. He was the only congressman that, that represented me as far as I was concerned. Uh, you know, his son is doing a pretty good job. I mean, I know Rand and you know, in the U.S. Senate. I mean, obviously, there's some things you know under Trump that I you know objected to. Um, he's doing a much better job. Uh, uh, now that Biden's there. But of course, you know, even with Trump, I mean, he went about as far as he can go in trying to push against the deficit spending uh, in, in the Republican Party. He's more pragmatic than his father was. His father was like, look, I'm going to, you know, this is my principle and I'm not budging. Uh, but I think Rand learned from the fact that his father, even though he was very principled, he didn't actually accomplish anything as far as government. So I think Rand is trying to make a bigger difference, although thus far I haven't really seen it, that work either, you know, because mm -hmm. it's just such a big machine that you're up against in, in Washington. Um, but, you know, I think people just need to, you know, fend for themselves, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I've done what I can by relocating to Puerto Rico. So, you know, at least I don't have to pay these crazy taxes. Right. Um, and, you know, I vote with my feet. I get out of the dollar. I've got my money invested in foreign stocks, not U.S. stocks. I own foreign currencies. I own commodities. I own real things. I own gold, silver. You know, I would suggest people do the same thing. You know, you know, vote with your feet financially. Uh, reject, you know, U.S. dollar denominated assets. We can read the writing on the wall. There's going to be a major uh, bust either in nominal terms or just in real terms through massive inflation. You know, people can you know, enlist my help. I mean, I'm happy. I mean, I manage uh, quite a bit of money for people helping to build international portfolios of good dividend paying foreign equities, uh, you know, through Europe Pacific Asset Management, uh, Europe Pacific Capital. Uh, you know, I'm also working with Shift Gold, the company that I founded, but that I, I still work with, but I sold the gold money, uh, you know, prior to my move to Puerto Rico. Uh, we have a great team over at Shift Gold helping people acquire physical precious metals no numismatics or collectibles, you know, low markups. A lot of, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that end up overpaying for gold, but nobody will overpay if they buy it from Shift Gold. Uh, but this <laughs> is what people need to do. You know, protect your portfolio, protect your retirement, avoid the inflation tax. I described it earlier. Inflation is a huge tax. If you don't want to pay that tax, you got to get out of what's being taxed, 
which is the US dollar. And what I'm doing is helping people avoid that tax because that is the most uh, serious tax. You know, Biden can cling to this idea that they're not raising taxes on anybody who earns less than 400,000, but they're raising the inflation tax dramatically and it falls the hardest on the people who earn less than 400,000. But everybody needs to uh, look for a, a way to avoid this inflation tax. And fortunately, there is a way to avoid it, at least on your savings. It's hard to avoid it on your wages if you're working for wages in the US. But if you have a retirement account, if you have a pension that you control, an IRA, you can divest of US dollars. And that's what I can help you do uh, at your specific uh, asset management. Well, I want to finally segue into Bitcoin and a few questions on that. But I just have one um, last question on economics, just because I'm a little bit curious on this end. I'm from Europe. Uh, my family came here wanting the American dream, like so many other families. They waited forever to be able to come here. And one of the things growing up that my family always thought was strange is that the American economy was based on how much people are spending and going into debt as opposed to how much they were saving. We were a big saving family, and I'm so grateful they taught me that. Um, but the other thing I noticed is that if you go to Europe and you know you you just came back from there, the quality of life seems a little bit better. I mean, I know they're not driving around in Ferraris and have the Beverly Hills mansions, but like they have you know two hour lunches and like everybody's kind of taken care of. And um, an average company in Europe, I think you know twelve to eighteen percent growth is considered really successful. And here in the U.S., it's like profit at all costs. You, you want as much growth as possible. It's sometimes these unrealistic expectations. And so do you think there's a problem with that? And do you think there's almost like a correlation between quality of life and, and employee happiness and how much you're working? Well, first of all, you know, those Ferraris are made in Italy. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I was in Switzerland for a month and I, I think the quality of life there clearly is, is higher than it is in the U.S. Just yeah. from the time I spent there and, uh, you know, looking at the quality of the infrastructure, the roads, the buildings. Uh, looking at the, yep. the cleanliness of the cities and the cars on the road and and things like that. But obviously, you know, Switzerland is, and you know, there are other countries in Europe that aren't nearly, uh, you know, as wealthy as, as Switzerland. Um, but, you know, I think it would be a shame if one day people have to leave America to live the American dream because it, it will no longer exist here. Uh, savings uh, are the lifeblood of capitalism. And unfortunately, Nobody saves now and for good reason. If you save, you're a sucker. You're going to lose money. You get no interest and inflation is going to destroy the value of, uh, of the principal. But to say that American companies, you know, it's profit at all costs. I don't even think so. Look at all these companies that have no profit. People don't even care about making a profit anymore. <laughs> profit is a good thing, right? Some people think that corporate profit, oh, that's a, a bad word. I mean, I did a video, you can watch it on my YouTube channel, uh, Democrats Ban Profits, where I went to the Democratic National Convention, I think in 2012, and I was asking the, the delegates if they would support a resolution to ban corporate profits. And a lot of people were like, yeah, sign me up, I support that. People think profits are bad. They think somehow it's what the business sucks out of the economy. Profits are an indication of what the company puts into the economy. That's what you get when you do a good job. If you can deliver value, if you can you can hire, you can take in resources, land, labor, and capital, right. combine them, and then create a product that people value more than the cost of producing it. The profit is not only your reward, but it's the market telling you, hey, you're doing a good job, make more. People want what you're producing, so produce more of it. Right like when now, you're losing money, that's like, hold on, put on the brakes, you're doing something wrong. What right now, businesses are operating without a profit, right? They're losing money and they and they're being rewarded for their losses with higher share prices because right. no one gives a damn about profits because you don't need profits to stay in business. You can stay in business by selling stock, you can just right. print stock certificates and sell them because of the Fed. So the name of the game now is to have a sexy story and drive revenue by losing money. You know, there was an old saying, yeah, we, 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 we lose money but on every sale, but we make it up in volume, right? That used to be a joke, but now that undermines the entire US stock market. We're actually trying to make it up. We're actually trying to make up for losing money on every sale by increasing the volume. And, and investors are, are buying into it 
and, and the stock prices go up. No, you're right. And on so many of those points, and what I sort of meant by profit at all costs was more so, you know, the executives, it seems like, profiting at all costs and the income levels of, of the people at the top increasing by, by so much. Um, but you're absolutely right, right because a lot of these companies ins- are not profitable. What's ins- but what's incentivizing right. the CEOs is the stock price. They're not incentivized to grow profits. They're incentivized yep. to get the stock price to go up, right? And, and in today's bubble economy, those things could be mutually exclusive. You can drive your stock price higher by sacrificing profitability because what investors want to see is revenue. They want to see sales. They want to see eyeballs, right? They want to see, because it's all about the future. Everybody is betting on the come and the, the, you know it's very inexpensive to make the bet because money is free. Right. All right, well, let's talk about the future a little bit and the future of Bitcoin versus gold, because <laughs> I know that, you know, you were on some shows earlier this week, uh, gold not having the best uh, 10 year return or the best year return. I mean, if there's so much inflation and, and people need a hedge, um, why aren't people going to gold? Obviously, Bitcoin's been appreciating hundreds of percent more. Yeah, I knew you'd get around to Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> And as far as Bitcoin's future, I don't think it has a future. It has a past for sure. <laughs> and it has a present for the moment. And obviously, you know, it has a short future because tomorrow is the future for today. Uh, and I'm sure Bitcoin will still be here when I wake up tomorrow. Um, but it doesn't have an infinite number of tomorrows. I mean, it's tomorrows are numbered. Um, you know, this is part of the bubble. You know, Bitcoin is not gold 2.0. It is tulip mania 2.0. You know, there's there's um, 11,200 or so cryptocurrencies now. Mm-hmm. New ones are born every day. So the supply continues to increase, not only of the number of cryptocurrencies that exist, but each cryptocurrency is increasing its supply every day, including Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, A lot of people in the Bitcoin community are certainly enjoying the fact that gold has retreated as somehow a validation of Bitcoin. Some people are trying to blame gold's decline on Bitcoin. Oh, it's because people are buying Bitcoin instead of gold. And there may be some people that are doing that, but not enough to affect the price of gold, maybe enough to affect the price of Bitcoin, uh, but not the price of gold. But again, things happen over longer time periods. So you can never just take a look at a short period of time and draw any you know, concrete conclusions just based on what's happened to the price of gold uh, in a short window when gold has 5,000 years of history. So gold's here for the, long, the long, uh, long game. But I think what's going on, and keep this in perspective because gold started going up in 1999, 2000, it was below $300 an ounce. So we're now 1750. And, and so if you just go back to the beginning of this millennium, uh, you know, gold is beating the S&P over, you know, that 22 year you know, time period, uh, even after the recent pullback uh, and with the markets at, at the highs. But again, I think the headwind for gold right now temporarily is the false belief that the Fed's got it covered, that inflation is transitory, that the Fed is going to normalize interest rates and shrink its balance sheet, taper QE, do all that, that it's going to bring inflation back down to 2%. And it's going to do it in a way that is negative for the gold market, because it's going to be higher interest rates, tighter monetary policy. I think that view is completely wrong. But that is the view that dominates the market. And so that is what is, is, is keeping the pressure on gold. At some point, that view is going to change, either because the Fed admits that it's not going to do those things or the market figures it out on its own. But one of those two things are going to happen and the price of gold is going to go way up. Now, what happens to the price of Bitcoin when that happens? I think Bitcoin, to the extent that it's correlated with gold, is probably a negative correlation. So if we really start to see a move up in gold, that could cause a drop in Bitcoin. Uh, But, you know, ultimately, Bitcoin's a bubble. Uh, Knowing when bubbles are going to pop for sure, it's very difficult. There's a hell of a lot of air in Bitcoin. And of course, not just Bitcoin, all these other cryptocurrencies. Uh, Ultimately, I don't think any of them have any value. I mean, 
to the extent that you have a cryptocurrency that's backed by something real, like if somebody issued a cryptocurrency backed by gold, then that cryptocurrency would have value. It would, it would be worth, you know, the gold that backed it up. Uh, but these cryptocurrencies that are popular are popular because they have no value. That's why they can keep going up because there's nothing stopping them from going up because there's no value uh, that they're tied to. They're just worth whatever some idiot is willing to pay. And, uh, you know, there's always a greater fool until you want run out of greater fools. And, and then you're the greatest fool and you're left holding the bag. And uh, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of bag holders in, in crypto land. Peter, when did you discover Bitcoin and how much did you dig into it and learn about it? Well, I discovered it. I didn't discover it. People told me about it. So it's not like I found it on my own. People said, hey, you know, look at this thing, Bitcoin, you know, when? buying it. Yeah, it was probably, you know, probably 2011. You know, it was early days. It wasn't the very beginning. It wasn't a penny. Um, but I think it was under $10. I can't remember for sure if it was under a dollar or not. Um, but it was it was under 10 for sure when I first learned about it. And I mean, I remember I liked it. I mean, I was like, you know, but I said, well, the, pro the reason it can't work is A, there's nothing to stop somebody else from coming up with another cryptocurrency. And of course, that's exactly what happened. There's, as I said, over 11,000 of them. And I know that none of those currencies have any qualities that are unique that Bitcoin doesn't possess. In fact, these newer cryptocurrencies are actually better than Bitcoin as far as the ease of use or the speed of the transactions and stuff like that. They're not any better in that they have no intrinsic value, but they're better in that you can move them around easier. Um, but but a lot of them are centralized and they don't have that digital scarcity that Bitcoin does. So potentially well, some of them are and some of them are not. I mean, there's plenty of them and they're decentralized, right? Bitcoin is not the only one. There's different kinds. You got proof of work, you got proof of stake, I mean, whatever. But conceptually, it's the same thing. It's just, a, a you know, uh, this digital token because it's not really a currency. Um, but I didn't think it could work as a store of value. I didn't think it would work as a unit of account. I did believe early on that it could be a medium of exchange, mainly in the black market. I saw the appeal early on that a lot of that appeal is being lost now by regulation. But back then, when I first heard about it, yeah, you want to buy something and you don't want anyone to know that you bought it. You want to bypass the banks to the extent that you could use Bitcoin, even if the Bitcoin dropped 20 or 30 percent while you were using it. That's the price you're willing to pay to launder your money. You know, I, so I could see uh, that maybe it could catch on. I just didn't, I did not at that point in time, did not foresee that it could be so widely adopted by so many people. Certainly I didn't foresee, you know, major uh, companies or investment banks getting involved. I, you know, that I was mistaken that this thing could ever get to such a big bubble. I mean, I appreciated what it was trying to do as a as a hard money guy, as an Austrian, as a libertarian. I appreciated it. I just was more focused on the underlying flaws that would ultimately be its undoing, rather than saying, you know what, maybe it'll work long enough that I can make some money on it. Right. And and, and so and I also knew that if I bought it, and I thought about it. I said, if I bought it, I can't tell anybody I bought it because I would feel bad about buying it and then encouraging other people to buy it simply because that would benefit me as somebody who already owned it. So because I knew how illiquid it was, I was like, can I, I can't really buy this and then tell people to buy it. I mean, that's too self-serving. I would have to just buy it and keep quiet about it. But but only <laughs> I didn't do it. And and then eventually it went way up. And and then by the time I thought about it again, as just like a gamble, right? Because I still, to this day, know that it's going to crash. But when it was 200, 300, 400 back then, and it had been there for like a year or two, it, you know, it went to a thousand and it pulled back down. Just looking at the chart of it, I was like, you know, this thing could have another big run, but I just couldn't get over the hump. Look, I didn't want to buy it at a few dollars. I'm not going to buy it at a hundred times what I didn't want to buy it at. Uh, and so just, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't participate. And then, of course, it ran up, you know, right. uh, to uh, 20,000. And, uh, you know, then it pulled back and it ran up to 65,000. But, you know, what, oh, I, I, since then, I haven't thought about buying it at all. I mean, I did think about it, you know, and I didn't do it, but it was a few hundred. 
um, as a gamble, just to gamble. I never believed that it would work. Um, but now I, it doesn't even, I, it, I wouldn't even consider buying it now. I mean, now I, it's, 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 it's all, as far as I'm concerned, it's all risk. I mean, I think the upside is limited uh, and the downside is huge. And there's so many other places that I can put money where it's the reverse that's true, where the upside is enormous. And I think my downside is limited. Well, I think you can agree that there are some very, very smart people who are in the Bitcoin space and have a lot of conviction in it. And I'm just kind of curious because one of the things I love about you is you, you're so your beliefs are so rooted in just history and you're very well read. So like how much have you gone down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin? Like, did you read the Bitcoin standard by Saifedean? Because a lot of the principles match right up with all the things you believe yeah, in with I, hard I money. Read, I read Saifedean's book. I've done interviews with Saifedean. I read the white paper you know i know a lot more about bitcoin than than people think people say well people peter doesn't like bitcoin because he doesn't understand it no i don't like it because i do understand it it's the people that like it that don't really understand money that's that's the problem i mean i'm not a programmer or a coder i mean i couldn't you know yeah. you know tell you how you know how all that works but i understand it i understand a lot more about bitcoin than the average guy who owns bitcoin Right. The average guy who owns it just owns it because it's going up and they think they're going to get rich. Um, but, yeah, there are a lot of smart people that are in Bitcoin. There are a lot of smart people in dot com stocks that went bankrupt in 2000. There are a lot of smart people in the mortgage market that started mortgage companies that owned the subprime mortgages. I shorted. I mean, there were a lot of there's always a lot of smart people on the wrong side of the trade. Uh, but there's also a lot of smart people who have completely rejected Bitcoin. You know, uh, a lot of other investors that I respect, you know, uh, you know, have the same feelings that I do. So you have plenty of smart people who have made a lot of money uh, in the investment world who completely see through this charade and think Bitcoin is, you know, a tulip mania. And then you have some smart people who have drunk the Kool-Aid. But I think there are more smart people on my side than than who have, you know, in Bitcoin. Um, so what would but, make you know i think i think the smart people you know some of these people are smart in a sense that they were smart enough to make money off bitcoin something that i was not right i mean there are people who are making a fortune off of bitcoin whether or not they actually believe in it who knows because once you're in the bitcoin world once you start a bitcoin company and you own a bunch of bitcoin you have to tell everybody how great it is because you need more people to buy it so we don't know how many of these smart people actually believe this nonsense, right? There was, an, I guess, an old saying in what, you know, never buy your own bullshit. And, you know, <laughs> a lot of these guys could be bullshitters. They're just talking their book. I don't know privately what they really think, right? But also, I think that once you own a bunch of Bitcoin, your judgment becomes clouded because you have such a vested interest in its success that it's almost like a cognitive dissonance that, you know, you can't see the problem. Now, people will accuse me of the same thing. Oh, Peter, you're so invested in gold. That's why you don't like Bitcoin, because, you know, gold, selling gold is a small part of my business. I mean, I can make a lot more money in, in, in crypto. I mean, there are a lot of companies. I mean, if I was like, hey, I was wrong. Yeah, crypto. I mean, I can I can write my own <laughs> ticket probably in the crypto world. I got a pretty big name. I can make a bunch of money, you know, on some shit coin or whatever. But I, I you know, that's I don't want to do that. Well, what would make you say, okay, I do believe in Bitcoin? Is there a certain market cap that it would reach where you would say, actually, maybe it is legitimate? Well, you know, a bubble doesn't become legitimate just because it gets bigger. I mean, I have seen nothing. I mean, if you go back and look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin today is not used in, transa in more transactions as a payment mechanism than it was when I first uh, found out about it. Nobody uses it. Well, on the I mean, Lightning Network, you know, people are transacting in it all the time now. No, I they're mean, not. We... They're trading it. They're not. People go to stores. People aren't buying. When I first heard about it, the pitch was, well, Bitcoin is better than gold because you can't buy a cup of coffee with gold and you can buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. Nobody is buying coffee with Bitcoin. <laughs> so, you know, if no one's buying anything, they are speculating. People collect Bitcoin. It's like a pet rock or Beanie Baby, except it doesn't have any <laughs> substance. But people collect them and that's it. Are there more Bitcoin collectors now than there were when I first learned about it? Yeah, of course, there's a lot more collectors, but it's not doing anything. You know, 
all of the, the, the promise, none of it has been fulfilled. And in fact, they reinvented Bitcoin. Okay, you know, it's not going to be used as a medium of exchange. It's not going to be a unit account. It's just digital gold. People are just going to buy it and hold on to it forever like they do with gold. And But of course, that misses the point of what gold is. Gold is a metal. If gold wasn't a valuable metal, nobody would own it. It wouldn't be money. The reason gold is a store of value is you're storing the metallic value of gold to be used in the future. So 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, human beings are going to be using the gold that is currently in a vault somewhere. Well, no, I, and I know you talk about how you don't like that Bitcoin. You say Bitcoin has no utility, but I mean, do you think emails have utility? Well, utility, see, utility is an economic principle. So utility is the ability to satisfy a need, right. right? So emails, I have a need to communicate with people and an email delivers me some utility because it helps me communicate. Right, you're delivering yeah. information through time and space. And so Bitcoin's no, doing the same Bitcoin thing. You're just transferring deliver. value. No, you're transferring deliver. value. No, no. I'm not delivering you anything when I deliver you Bitcoin. I'm just giving you the Bitcoin. but. The, the, being able to give you Bitcoin does not give Bitcoin utility. The way you have to see if Bitcoin has utility is, okay, look at gold. Why does gold have utility? Well, I can take gold and I can make jewelry out of it, right? You have some jewelry around your neck, right? Uh, I can take gold and I can conduct electricity with it, which is very important. I can use it in computer chips. I can use it in aerospace. You know, I can use it in medicine, all sorts of things that I can do with gold, right? What can you do with your Bitcoin? Apart from the fact that you, I know you can send it to somebody else, but if you have to use the Bitcoin, you can't give it to anybody else. All you can do is keep it yourself. What, what need do you have that you can satisfy with that Bitcoin? Well, I mean, in, in this digital world, don't you think there is utility in being able to transfer no, no, value through no, no. time and space? Like that is the no, no, value? You're not, you're, not, no, you're not transferring value, you're transferring the Bitcoin. Right? That is the what value. Gives, <laughs> no, what gives the Bitcoin value, right? So you've got to tell me, alone in your apartment, what can you do with your Bitcoin? What can you make from your Bitcoin? What problem does Bitcoin solve for you? If you have to keep the Bitcoin, you can't give it to anybody else. You so, keep it. You know. Right. So for me, I'm I'm trying to store my life savings, my the energy, the money that I've earned but in a safe no place that's going to increase. But money but is when energy. Storing, when you're storing your life savings in gold, you're storing it in a metal, <laughs> right? That people are going to need in the future, right? I mean, you can store your life savings in wheat because people are going to eat wheat in the future, but <laughs> it takes up a lot of space. And what if it rots, right? You can store oil, but where are you going to put that, right? So you have to, you know, you can take a different metal. You can store copper. You can just load up on old pennies, but, you know, they're going to take up a lot of space. So gold is an easy commodity to store your, your work. But when you're storing Bitcoin, you're not storing anything that anybody is ever going to need. Nobody needs it now. Nobody is going to need it in the future. Now, there are people who want Bitcoin now because they believe that the price is going to go up. But that, 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 that's just a gamble. The, the, the price is not value. Bitcoin has a price. It doesn't have any value. It just has a price. And that price is a function of what people expect the price to be in the future. And as long as people expect the future price to be higher, they'll be willing to buy it. But once people no longer have that expectation, they're not going to want it and the price is going to crash. So if it continues to go up at some point, like, are you just, you're fixed in this place? Is this about stubbornness or are you hedging your bet with your son? Because I know Spencer's in Bitcoin. No, 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 no. So you're kind of in Bitcoin, whether you want to be or not. Spencer doesn't own enough for it to be a hedge. <laughs> Spencer is 18. <laughs> He's never had, a, well, actually now he had a part-time, I, I got him a little part-time job. So he earned a little money. And he has earned some a little bit of money on the side, but he hasn't had a real job. He's a college freshman. Now he's going to be a college sophomore. Um, but look, people ask me that question again all the time. At what point? Look, it went to 65,000 and I, I still didn't say uncle, right? So, you know, we're, we're well below there now, right? Where are we now? Around 40, right. something, 43, 4,000 or something like that. But the question I asked, I mean, I can put this question to you. At what point 
on the downside, would you say, oh, I was wrong about Bitcoin. I don't want it anymore. I'm getting rid of it. Most people tell me there is no point that if Bitcoin went to a thousand, they would still hold on to it. So I don't know. Is there a point where you throw in the towel? I mean, how low would Bitcoin have to fall in the price before you would say, ah, you know what? It's not right. I, I must I must have gotten it wrong. I'm, I'm going to move on. Where do you cut your losses and get out? Well, you know, I've been one of those strong, strong hands that have been holding on. I got in in 2017 and even I bought right up at, into the rally. I dollar cost average and it dropped a lot. And obviously people were worried that it would crash even more. And I, I never sold because I believe in the long oh, term without, and I was buying more of the, the dip. Yeah, without telling me how much you own, because it's really none of my business. But what's your average price? Do you even know? Uh, my average price is about $12,000. All right, yeah. so you're sitting on a nice gain at the moment on paper. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've never collected any interest or dividends on nope. your Bitcoin. So the only gain you have is on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the price were to drop below 10,000 to where you've now have a loss on paper, um, would you just buy more or would you, would you sell? I would probably buy more, but see, that's the thing. Like, I truly believe in this technology. So I, I guess what I'm what I'm sensing from you is we both agree that we need to return to a system of sound money, right? We need we need the dollar. We need our currency backed by something. And I know that you've, you've mentioned you would b potentially believe in a digital currency if it was backed by gold. So we need sound money. Satoshi, whoever he or she may be, created this digital version of sound, scarce money. And, you know, in a world where if the US dollar fails, potentially we need another global reserve asset. You just, you essentially just don't believe in the technology. Would you want us to return well, to the not, gold standard? It's got nothing to do with not believing in the technology. I understand the technology. It's not about whether I believe in it or not. It exists, mm -hmm. right? I just don't believe that the Bitcoin itself, that digital token has value. Um, and, and I don't believe it constitutes sound money. And, you know, sound money the term didn't even originate because of scarcity. It actually originated because of the sound that the money made when you dropped it, right? Because paper money, if you drop a paper bill on the table, it doesn't make any noise. But if I drop a gold or silver coin on the table, it makes a sound. So that's why it's sound money, because it's real. It has substance. It has value. What gives fiat money value is confidence, right? What gives gold value is its properties as metal. People want gold to use it as a metal, right? That's what gives it its value. Even if you don't need the gold, somebody else does. And so there, there's a value there. Um, but when you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a lot more in common with fiat in that Bitcoin's value is derived in the same manner from confidence, from faith. It doesn't have any intrinsic value on its own. People just value it because they, they, they think it has value. Well, that's the same thing with, with fiat currency. People value it because they think it has value. But the reason that people think dollars have value is because I could go to a store and, and somebody will take dollars for food. They'll take dollars. My landlord takes dollars for rent or, you know, uh, the government takes dollars. In fact, the government requires dollars to pay your taxes. So, you know, you, you, you know your employer, you get a job. He pays you in wage in dollars. I mean, it's all the, so there's a lot of reasons that people have confidence in the dollar. Eventually, you know, the dollar is going to fail despite that confidence. But, you know, the confidence in Bitcoin is surely a function of the belief that the price is going to keep going up because you don't have this history of use. You don't have, you know, Bitcoin, you know, circulating throughout the economy, you know, in prices and wages and insurance and bonds and all that. So the confidence in Bitcoin is much more tenuous, I think, than the confidence in the dollar or the euro or the yen. And it's much easier to lose. And, and once the confidence is gone, then all the market prices is gone. Um, you know, people will never lose confidence in gold because it's not a confidence game. You know, gold is a metal, just like copper, just like, you know, silver or, you know, it's a commodity, it's an element. And as long as there are things that you could use that element for, and as long as it satisfies certain needs better than others, then there's demand for it. 
So what will you do in a world where people are transi- transacting in Bitcoin? I mean, obviously, Bitcoin doesn't have the 5,000 year history that gold does, but we have a, you know, a very nice logarithmic chart over the last 12 years where the number has been going up and we have been appreciating a lot more than gold. So when, you know, AMC is yeah. accepting it, place it here in L.A., you can pay your rent in Bitcoin. So what will Peter Schiff do in a Bitcoin transactional world? <laughs> well, that world has not developed during that 12 years of chart. Right. The price has gone up, but it, its use has not. Now, there are more people. You could find the odd landlord that would take uh, a rent in Bitcoin, but no landlord is going to fix the, the, the rent in Bitcoin, meaning, OK, I'm going to rent this apartment and the rent is one tenth of a Bitcoin uh, <laughs> per month. And every month you're just going to pay me one tenth of a Bitcoin regardless of the value of that Bitcoin. No, the way people would accept Bitcoin in payment is you would agree on the dollar amount of the rent. And then on the first of the month, when that rent is due, you would figure out how many Bitcoin you need to buy at that price to then deliver. So the Bitcoin isn't being used as money. It's just barter because the person who is your landlord decides that he wants some Bitcoin and he is bartering you some Bitcoin uh, for your living in the apartment. But it's not being used as a money, as money or a unit of account or a medium of exchange. It's just barter. And so, yes, there are more people today who will barter with Bitcoin than 12 years ago. But it's not being used as money. It's never going to be used as money. You know, even when AMC as a as a stunt to try to goose their inflated stock price, they came out and said, oh, we're going to set, we're going to accept Bitcoin for movie tickets. Even Anthony Pompliano was like, <laughs> oh, no one's going to buy a movie ticket with Bitcoin. No one's going to buy popcorn with Bitcoin. Of course. It's yeah, all we want to hold it. We want to hold he it. He wants yeah. them to just go out and buy it and help pump up the price. You know, don't actually use it. Just buy it. Put it on your balance sheet. Yeah, that's all you can do in Bitcoin is speculate on it. It's just a gigantic bubble. It's a it's a it's a part Ponzi part pyramid, (laughs) part chain letter, all rolled into one. And I think eventually, you know, instead of Ponzi scheme, when people talk about it, this is going to be a brand new name. It's going to be a Bitcoin scheme. Oh, wow. 100 years from now, it's like, oh, that guy's got another Bitcoin scheme. Okay, That's last bit- the Bitcoin legacy. It's going to let Ponzi off the hook. <laughs> okay, last Bitcoin question, and then I'll wrap up. Do you believe, though, that Bitcoin will reach $100,000 a coin? Oh, you know... If you had I to bet on say, it, if you had to bet on it, do you believe Bitcoin think, will reach 100000 it, it, it It certainly could do it. I mean, it's not that big a stretch. I mean, it went to 65000 So if it can go to 65000 it could go to a million. It's hard to say. I mean, let's say it's at least, let's say it's a 50-50 shot. I really don't know, you know, because anything can happen. But I wouldn't want to bet on it because I think there are other assets that I can own that can have a similar appreciation. Uh, and I think less risk because if I'm going to admit that Bitcoin might go to 50,000, you got to admit that it might go to 5,000. It might go a lot lower than that. <laughs> so there's, 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 you know, a lot of risk uh, in that in the price forecast. And, um, you know, and when I mentioned to you, like, you know, if it goes to 10,000, you said you're going to buy more. Will you buy more at 5,000? Will you buy more at 1,000? Will you buy more at 100? Will you spend your entire life throwing good money after bad money and just keep <laughs> buying more and more Bitcoin no matter how low the price goes and just keep sinking your hard earned money into it? Well, maybe it's bad money going into bad I mean, fiat's not well, good right. money, so. Bad money is bad money, <laughs> but whatever. But it's, um, a, it's an expression of, uh, you could have bought gold, you could have you could have bought real estate, you could have bought stocks, but instead you bought air. <laughs> you know, did you see? Did you see the little video I posted? A, a Sesame Street video about Bitcoin. No, I'll have yeah, to check, check it out. out. I mean, it's really funny. Uh, you know, it's on Shift Clips. But All just right. Google Peter Shift Sesame Street or Bitcoin <laughs> Sesame Street or. Okay, watch that little video. Yeah. Well, um, just to wrap up here, you know, you've had this amazing career. I think you're a phenomenal voice in this space that, you know, helps people learn about economics. And uh, just, you know, to kind of wrap up, you know, reflecting on your life, I know you've obviously wanted to help in a lot of ways. You had, you went out to Occupy Wall Street. You ran for office at one point. When you look back, is if you could think of one thing you wish you knew when you were younger, like you wish that everybody kind of knew and got, like, what's... Well, there are a lot of what do you things, want to, obviously. Look... 
Clearly, I wish I'd have bought Bitcoin, right? When I first heard about it, that was a key mistake. <laughs> That's the number one. That's awesome. I, no, but I mean, I, obviously, I mean, I, I mean, and, you know, I mean, I had, I mean, I was well, you know, I was wealthy at the time. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I'm wealthier now, uh, but could I have put a hundred thousand dollars in it? Yeah, I could have. I mean, I put a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in other things that, that, that turned out poorly. Could I have put a million dollars in it? I could have. Uh, I mean, I think it's a stretch to think I would have made that big a bet on that. But again, I put a million dollars into other investment opportunities and that didn't work out even that, you know, so I, I, I could have. But, I, you know, obviously I could be, you know, uh, you know, one of the Bitcoin billionaires. I mean, mm -hmm. I was in a position because I knew about it early on mm -hmm. and I had the resources to, to buy it. And I was a free market, hard money, libertarian guy. So, I mean, I had that opportunity. So clearly, you know, uh, you know. Yeah, if I can go back in time, that's one of the things I would do. Like, you know, a lot of other things I would do, you know, <laughs> once you know how things turn out, right? But the other thing is, had I bought all that Bitcoin back then, there's no way to know when I would have sold, if I would have sold. I mean, maybe I'd have held on, you know, who knows? Just no way to know. And, and I can't second guess the things that I did or regret what I did or what I didn't do. But what I'm not going to do is make the mistake of buying it now because I didn't buy it back then and thinking that this is still a ground floor opportunity. This is when the people who got in on the ground floor are getting out. And I'm not going to be somebody's exit strategy. If you're going to if you're going to cash out, it's not with my money. You know, it's, it's some other sucker that's going to uh, be, be enabling you. But look, you know, if you're if you're in the Bitcoin, the advice that I keep giving people in Bitcoin and, you know, and I give the same advice to you. Take your money out. Right. You got a twelve thousand uh, dollar cost basis. That means there's probably you can take a third of your money out. You can sell a third of your Bitcoin and now you're rolling on the house's money. Don't buy anymore. If you're right and it goes to millions of dollars in Bitcoin, you'll be rich. Right. So you got enough um, and just stay there, you know, uh, and then and then make some other investments with 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 the other money in case I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> Uh, you know, take something off the table. There's an old Wall Street saying, bulls make money, bears make money, pigs get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. Don't be a pig, you know, and don't be afraid to lose out on a, on a rally. People are afraid to sell their Bitcoin because they think it's going to keep going up, right? Uh, get over that. I, I've made that mistake with other assets where I was afraid to sell and, and watch my paper profits go away. Not with Bitcoin, but with other stocks and things like that. So it's some... Uh, words of wisdom from somebody who's experienced that emotion where you get emotionally tied to an investment that's working out and you never want to sell because you're afraid of missing out on all the other gains. And then all of a sudden the whole thing implodes. Uh, so, you know, take some something off the table. You don't get out of it completely. I'm not saying get off the train completely. Uh, you win either way. Take some money off the table. If it keeps going up, you're a winner. If it collapses, you're still a winner. Um, and, you know, listen to my podcast, you know, I do my podcast, you know, two, three times a week, yeah. if your listeners don't know about it, uh, the Peter Schiff show podcast, uh, you can listen to it Great. Schiff radio yeah. uh, or on my YouTube channel, Peter Schiff, get the other side, uh, about gold and Bitcoin, but also I'm doing all the macroeconomic analysis, yep. and, you know, a lot of the people in Bitcoin, you know, share this perspective. So they have a similar diagnosis. They just got have a different prescription about what to do about it. Peter, as what far do you want personal finance? Peter, what do you want your legacy to be? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to. I, I, I hope my legacy doesn't come around for a long time. <laughs> I, I want. I, I want. I want to live for 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 a while. But I guess you know when I'm older, we can start thinking about my legacy. <laughs> but right now, I want to live. I don't. Well, I, you'll I, be I, you'll I wanna, be around long. Be around. Yeah, you'll be around long enough to see Bitcoin in this in the millions. So that'll be fun. And I, actually. I'll, 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 I'm not going to live that long, but I think I will live, <laughs> live, I, I will live long enough to see it crash. <laughs> well, whether you like it or not, you've done, I think, a lot for Bitcoin's adoption on Twitter. You're, you're big in the Bitcoin space, so that's why I wanted to have you on Coin Stories. Thank you so much. Any just final, final words? I, we're obviously in a really tumultuous time, but I always like to end on kind of, you know, something positive as well, because we do, we're, we're Americans. I feel like a lot of people... W they want to persevere. We believe in strengthening ourselves and um, we have hope that we could get to a better place and rebuild families and businesses and communities. So, I mean, what are, what are your final takeaways? 
Um, hopefully, Bitcoin introduced a lot of people to certain concepts that maybe they don't quite understand now, but at least they're on the right track. People who are in Bitcoin now know what fiat money is and they don't like the central bankers and they want hard money. That's great. You know, so after they lose in Bitcoin, maybe they can move over to actual hard money and, and don't reject these ideas of free markets and capitalism and, you know, liberty, uh, because that's part of the Bitcoin movement. So hopefully they retain that uh, even after they lose their money. And, 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 and one of the good things is a lot of the people who are going to get wiped out in Bitcoin are young. So the best time to lose money is when you're young because you have a lot of time to earn it back. You know, I feel sorry for some of the older people who have gotten into this, who put their retirement money into Bitcoin, who are going to get completely wiped out. That's very unfortunate. Uh, for younger people, you're all about to learn a very valuable lesson. <laughs> all right. Well, Expensive, we but you know, valuable. Thank you so, so much, Peter. I really appreciate your time. And one last sure. time, where can people find you? Well, as I said, you can find me at you know my uh, shift radio uh, at um, uh, my YouTube channel, Peter Schiff. Follow me on Twitter. I finally got verified on Twitter. You know, I had to get over 500,000 followers before I finally got verified. But I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. So I'm there in social media. So, you know, follow me on those various platforms. Contact me. You know, if you want to hire me as your investment manager, your broker, go to the website at Europe Pacific Capital, Europe Pacific Asset Management, uh, Shift Gold. If you want to take some of your Bitcoin winnings off the table and you know put it someplace safe, buy some buy some real money. <laughs> um, so you go there. Uh, I got some books out there. My most recent book is uh, The Real Crash: America's Coming Bankruptcy. You can pick it up on uh, Amazon or any of these websites. I actually have a book. Uh, a, a website, shiftbooks.com. I sell some of my dad's books. Federal Mafia uh, was uh, his most recent book. We've got copies available at shiftbooks.com. In fact, it's one of only two books in U.S. history to be banned by the U.S. government. One was Fanny Hill, which was banned for pornography. And then there's my father's book wow. that was banned, the Federal Mafia. But you can still buy it legally, even though it was banned. Uh, and so you can, you can get some copies at uh, 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 shiftbooks.com. All right, well, check it out and Bitcoin to 100. <laughs> to 100, you're right, $100. <laughs>